This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. So uh, I'm uh, going to call the Finance Committee meeting of February 5th, 2021 to order. Um, it is now uh, five minutes after two. And the meeting was scheduled for 2 p.m. Uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law, Chapter 30, Section 18, this meeting of the Finance Committee is being conducted via remote uh, participation. And I just want to go very quickly into explaining what we're going to do. Um, and uh, uh, because the first item of business needs to be um, the election of officers. But before doing so, I'm going to, um, as is required by the open meeting law, make sure that all members of the committee who are uh, present at the, at the time, which I think is all but one, can hear me and that we can hear them by their responding in the affirmative. So I'll uh, start with Lynn Griesmer. Unmute and uh, let us know that we can hear you. Present. Okay, Bob Hegner. Here. Uh, Kath Shane. Here. Dorothy Pam. Unmute, Dorothy. Here. Uh, Pat Angelus. Present. And Bernie Kubiak. Hey, hey, uh, Andy, uh, Jane's in the attendees. Okay, can somebody, um, do we have a, uh, are you? I will let her in. Jane? You should be able to unmute and Andy will ask if you're here. Jane, uh, you just need to uh, let us know that, um, that you're on board and that we so that, and that you're hearing me and then let, that confirms we can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, great. So um, then we have all members of the committee present. Um, so the next order of business, uh, is uh, goes to um, Lynn to conduct um, the first part of the election process. So every time, every uh, January, the town council um, forms new memberships on committees. Actually, in this case, there was no change on this committee. Um, so at this point, we also then vote for chair and vice chair. So the floor is open for nominations for chair of the finance committee. Kathy? Please unmute. I nominate Andy if he's willing to continue. Andy, are you willing to continue? I, I will continue for another year if, if the committee desires. Okay. Are there any other nominations at this time? Then we're going to vote and I'm going to try to do this alphabetically. I'm going to start with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Dorothy Pam? Aye. Kathy Shane? Aye. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Okay. Uh, thank you. Andy is unanimously elected chair of the Finance Committee. The floor is now open for the election of vice chair. Are there any nominations? Dorothy Pam, you have your hand up. I nominate Kathy Shane. Okay, Kathy, are you willing to serve in that capacity if elected? Yes. Are there any other nominations from the floor for vice chair? Seeing none, then I'm going to call the election closed and we're going to vote. And we start with, in this case, uh, um, actually Lynn Griesmer and it's an aye. Uh, Dorothy Pam? Aye. Uh, Andy Steinberg? <laughs> aye. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. And Kathy Shane. Yes. 
It's unanimous. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I uh, I would appreciate it if the uh, um, resident members of the committee, even though they are not voting members, I think they're going to vote the same way, but I think that their voices should be heard as part of the vote. Okay. Uh, so I will ask Bob Hegner first. Um, I I agree with uh, both uh, the chair and the vice chair. <clears throat> Bernie Kubiak. I'm certainly in agreement with the, the nominees. Okay, and Jane Scheffler. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so, it just seems to me we need to remember to include them in things we do. Thank you. Um, uh, Andy, I'm turning it over to you. Okay, thank you. It should allow me to very quickly turn it over to somebody. I think that many members of the committee met last year, um, and though there are uh, a couple of people who may not have been present, uh, but Tanya Campbell has been uh, with Lance and Heath working with the town of Amherst for a number of years. She can uh, own up if she wants to as to how many years that is. Uh, but in conducting the annual audit and then making the presentation to the audit committee. And uh, this is the point in the year where under the revised uh, policy of the council, the finance committee is acting as the audit committee. And that is the purpose of the uh, presentation today uh, that um, Tanya is going to make. So uh, I want to Welcome you, Tanya. And uh, Tanya is going to uh, take over the screen sharing function so that she can uh, show uh, the part of the presentation and uh, help us to w walk through the audit as uh, she determines appropriate. And then, of course, uh, people will, will follow up with questions. And if I see hands coming up during the discussion, I will. I may choose to interrupt and see if I uh, want to address questions as they go. But Tanya, welcome. Thank you. Yes, I'm getting used to this whole new world of uh, doing these presentations remotely. Um, it's nice to see you all again, although it'll be much better in person. Um, can you guys see, I'm gonna hold on. Can you see my, the presentation? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Can I just, can you turn it into slideshow because you've just made them smaller. If it's slideshow, I think we'll see it better. Um, are you seeing the... I'm I seeing see. two slides. I see. Hold on one sec. Let me just share my other screen. Um, can you see the... That's great. Full, full screen yeah. now? Okay, perfect. Thanks. No one's ever mentioned that before, so I wonder if I've always done that wrong. Um, so as Andy said, I'm here today to present the results of the town's fiscal year 2020 audit. Um, I'm a principal with Melanson Heath, and, or Melanson now, uh, it used to drop, we dropped the Heath. Um, and uh, I've been working on the town's audit for um, the past 14 years. I've been with the firm. I've done the audit um, every year, and I've been the principal in charge of the audit for the past uh, few years. There was another principal in charge um, prior to myself, Pat Squalante, who I'm sure you guys remember um, doing this prior to me. Now, in terms of um, what I wanted to discuss today, I want to have a brief conversation about the nature and purpose of the financial statement audit, including um, the roles and responsibilities as us, as your independent auditors, as well as management's responsibilities and um, the finance committee's responsibilities when acting um, in the audit, audit committee capacity. Um, and then I wanna review a couple of the pages in the town's financial statements and talk about some of the key numbers um, and certainly, you know, feel free to stop me at any point in time if you have any questions at all, you know, during the, um, during the presentation. Now, in terms of our responsibilities as the independent auditor, our ultimate responsibility is to express an opinion on the town's financial statements. And in order to do that, we must plan for former audit 
to provide reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance, that the financial statements are free of material misstatements. So as I know I've you know, mentioned in the past, you know, an audit does not provide 100% assurance. We can't come in and pour through every single transaction that passed through the town during the fiscal year. It's just, it's just not possible. And that's not the way that audits are designed to happen. Instead, our audits are conducted under a set of standards known as government auditing standards. And those standards require that we plan and perform our audit procedures using a concept known as materiality. Now, materiality will vary based on um, the size of the entity itself and as well as the different components of the town itself. Um, and for instance, in fiscal year 2020, the materiality for the town's general fund or your main operating fund was about $150,000. Now that doesn't mean we don't look at anything below that because we certainly do. It just says that auditing standards say we should focus our testing on um, the balances at or above that level. Now in terms of management's responsibilities as part of the audit process, they are ultimately responsible for the town's financial statements. They're also responsible for establishing and maintaining effective internal control and ensuring that the town complies with the various laws and regulations that are applicable to its um, daily activities. During the audit, they're responsible for making um, all financial records and data available to us in a timely fashion so we can complete our audit um, in a reasonable time frame. And at the end of the audit, they're responsible for providing us with a letter that confirms um, the various representations that were made to us during the audit process, um, basically stating that, you know, what they told us was true and accurate to the best of their ability and what they, what they know to be true. And just as an FYI, an audit does not relieve um, the management of its responsibilities in regards to the financial statements. They are ultimately management's responsibilities. Now, in terms of the finance committee's responsibilities as part of this audit process, um, you guys are here to assist the town council in the oversight of the financial statements, as well as you know, the oversight over the internal control process and um, you know, to varying degrees, the town's risk assessment evaluation. Um, you also help educate the town council members on understanding the financial statements if, if they wanted to um, uh, gain a greater understanding. Um, this is part of the purpose of, uh, you know, our presentation too. So I can educate you and then you can educate them if they had questions. You're also responsible for reviewing the management letter, which would contain recommendations made um, as part of the audit process, uh, if applicable. We actually did not issue a formal management letter um, in fiscal year 2020. So you guys are off the hook on that for this year. Now, In terms of the town's financial statements themselves, they're presented under rules established by the Government Accounting Standards Board, which is also known as GASB. You'll see various references to their different um, statements in the financial statements themselves. And there are essentially um, five components to your financial statements. There is the audit opinion, management, which, um, management discussion analysis, your two sets of financial statements, your government-wide statements and your fund basis statements. And then lastly, your footnotes and required supplementary information. Now, the audit opinion is the only part of the financial statements that actually belongs to us as your independent auditors. In fiscal year 20, we issued the town an unqualified opinion on the financial statements, meaning that based on the results of our testing, we found that the town was in compliance with generally accepted accounting principles. Next comes your management's discussion and analysis, which um, is a required narrative of the financial statements. And it basically summarizes the information that's included in the financial statements, as well as some of the key um, numbers and results of operations from the past fiscal year. After that, you have your two sets of financial statements themselves and which we'll look at in um, pieces of those in just a minute and talk about some of the numbers on those pages. 
And then lastly, you have your footnotes and required supplementary information, which provides um, a great deal of information uh, and disclosures on the actual numbers that are reported on the financial pages themselves. Does anyone have any questions on that so far? Okay. Okay, so I don't know if people have um, the PDF document of the financial statements handy or if you have it printed out. Um, we're looking right now at um, page 17 of the printed document, which is also page 20 of the PDF, if you wanted to look at the full, um, full page itself. Um, the numbers on the right are a snapshot of the town's balance sheet, which is one of your um, fund basis statements. Now, your fund basis statements are the set of statements that more closely resemble um, the town's records and the reports you would receive on a monthly basis. Um, they report all the um, governmental funds. And what we're looking at um, right there is the the column that represents the general fund and um, the it includes the town stabilization fund as well. Now I have boxed one number in towards the bottom there, which is your unassigned fund balance number. That number is essentially made up of, of two, um, two balances. The first um, is the town stabilization fund, which at the end of fiscal year 20 had just over $12 million in that fund. Um, you know, that balance itself represents 22% um, of the town's uh, annual tax levy for fiscal year 20, um, which is a very healthy balance. Um, you know, one of the highest I've seen in terms of some of the audits that we do. Uh, I know the town has really um, made a commitment over the years to put money into, into that fund and really establish that to, to what it is today. So that's, that's really very impressive. Um, you know, DOR recommends, you know, towns try to achieve a 10% of the tax levy um, in their stabilization funds. So the town, the town is doing a very good job um, setting money aside in that fund. The other portion of that balance is your general fund unreserved fund balance, which is just, um, just over $7 million at the end of 2020. That is essentially the, you know, what's left over at the end of the year after you've set everything aside for what other commitments you've made. Um, and it's essentially uh, the starting point for the town's free cash calculation number. And that balance at the end of 20 represented uh, about 13% of the town's tax levy. Also a very healthy um, balance in that fund. Another number that isn't on this page, but I just wanted to, to mention it, the town certified free cash at, for fiscal year 20 was um, almost five and a half million dollars, which represents about six and a half percent of the annual operating budget. DOR recommends, you know, no lower than three to five percent of uh, the annual operating budget is where your free cash should land. So that also is a very healthy number. Um, you know, the town has done a good job over the years in terms of um, budgeting its revenues and expenses conservatively in order to turn back and kind of replenish the free cash that's used on an annual basis and um, does a good job in terms of, of managing free cash and what you're, what you're using your free cash for. You're not using it for operating items, you're using it to, to build your reserves, um, your stabilization, OPEB, um, and for other, you know, capital projects and stuff as needed, so. Tanya, before you move off of this page, mm -hmm. the question, Dorothy Pam has one. Mm -hmm. You got me confused when you said unreserved, but it's not on this page. Oh. But I'm trying to figure out. No, nope, that's okay. What that um, means to have a number that's important, but it's not written down. So the number I have box, which says unassigned. Yeah. That $19 million number, that is made up of $12 million of your stabilization fund and the $7 million of your, um, it's called unreserved general fund balance, but it's it's what, uh, yeah, I know. And they changed the wording over the years too. It used to be unreserved. Okay. So the you said the overall um, unassigned was great mm -hmm. and 
then you said something about the 7 million unreserved. You said that was good and that's on the way to free cash. Is that what you said? Yeah, it's, it's essentially like the starting point for the town's free cash calculation. So DOR will start there and then do all their adjustments to back out various things. So right. um, that's Thank one you. way to think of that number. Yep. Any other questions on this page? I don't see. Okay. Okay. So the next page is um, a snapshot of your statement of net position, which is on, this one is on page 15 of the financials or 18 of the actual PDF document itself. Now your statement in that position is one of your government wide statements, which um, are different than your fund basis statements. Your, your government wide statements, they take and consolidate all of the various funds of the town and only distinguish between your governmental activities and your business type activities. So your governmental activities will include things such as your general fund, your special revenue or your grant funds, uh, your capital project funds, um, those kind of governmental funds, while your business type activities are your town enterprise funds. So those are the two columns um, on this statement. Now, the intent of um, your government wide statements are to take your town operations and essentially report them as if a business would report them. So we take your fund basis statements and then we add um, the town's capital assets and your long-term debt and other long-term liabilities like your bonds payable, your pension liability, and your OPEP liability. So while they don't reflect how the town operates on a day-to-day -day basis, those are more in line with how the, the fund basis statements are presented. These statements do a good job in terms of showing the true assets and liabilities um, of the town. Now, the two numbers I want to talk about on this page were your net pension liability and your net OPEB liability. The net pension liability, um, that amount represents the town share of the Hampshire County retirement systems unfunded liability. Last year, that number was um, just over $59 million. And this year, it's just right around $54 million. So there was uh, about a $5 million decrease from the prior year. And a couple things caused um, that decrease. Uh, first of all, the town's share of the entire system's liability itself decreased slightly um, between last year and this year. So that would cause your share of the liability to go down. And there was also um, better market results, um, you know, better investment returns uh, for the system in the in the year um, that's presented in your 2020 financial statements, which was pretty consistent across the board for um, retirement systems. They saw good rates of return and good investment returns um, in calendar year 2019. So that caused um, the system's funded percentage to increase up to 64% when last year it was um, almost 59%. So that, that change decreased the overall liability that's being split by all the different member towns. So your share went down. Um, those were some of the main reasons for the decrease there. Could we pause there for a minute? And mm -hmm. Sean and Paul, can you explain if there is any relationship here between this and the legislation that Joe and Mindy were so successful in getting passed? Um, I, don't, I can't see if Paul's here, so I can he track on it. Um, so I. My understanding is that this number did at the time include the pension liability for the, the Hampshire Council of Governments. Yep. And now that that, is, that liability is gonna be assumed, I would think we would see an impact on this next time around. Um, Tanya, I don't know, have you heard anything about that? Um, I've heard that the legislation passed, um, but yes, it would, these numbers are based on 1231-19, um, results and so another year, yeah, yeah. At that so at that point in time, um, um, they were still part of the system. Going forward, um, they will they should come off that um, come out of the system. You know, I'm not sure how much that'll actually 
impact everyone else because basically you're just taking out their share so like i i guess it would it would go your share or your overall share would go down slightly if that portion of the liability went away went away and the assets are staying the same so yeah you should see result from that probably i don't know if next year's i don't know if next year is gonna have any impact because they have a valuation every two years and they just had one as a 1120. So the next one would theoretically be 1122. I'm not sure if they're going to pick that up in between. They may, but yeah, I, we can find out the answer and um, get yeah. back. But yeah. but eventually that will be a, a small positive for us. Yep. Yeah, I can't imagine it has a big effect because you're removing two pieces. You're removing the uh, share of liability you know, the amount of the liability, but you're also reducing the number of people who are um, being calculated into the um, the number that's used, so. Yeah, it'll, it'll help the unfunded. So the unfunded portion of their liability will come out and that right. will become an unfunded portion of somebody else's liability. So that'll help, you know, these are sort of balance sheet numbers, um, you know, they're long-term, planning number. So again, it'll, it won't have a real noticeable impact on our annual pension assessment, but in terms of the, the long-term costs, it might help a little bit. Yeah, I can see that. And the year-to-year well. -year variable has to do with the number of employees in each town that participates in the Hampshire retirement system. Right. right. So, so the costs go away and their share goes away, but yeah, so your annual assessment probably won't change too, too much, but it could. Yeah. Um, any other questions about the net pension liability? Now, um, the number right below that is the town's net OPEB liability, which represents the town's share of your retiree health insurance costs. The prior year liability number was um, close to $53 million. Uh, so the town saw a very large increase um, this year, $14.5 million increase. Um, most of that was a result of the change in actuaries from prior years. Um, every actuary does calculations and factors things in slightly differently. Um, so this new actuary, um, you know, had a bunch of ch different changes in what they call change in assumptions um, from the prior year um, based on how they're calculating the liability, um, which are all kind of listed out in the actual but notes of the financial statements themselves. They're on um, page 61. Um, and that, that was the main main reason for the for the increase there. Um, and we'll keep, um, Tanya, real quick, we'll, we're gonna have a separate OPEB agenda at some point yeah. in the future where the actuary will come and explain those changes in more detail. Um, okay. Yeah, that's great. Linda's, Linda's wonderful. Um, you know, I think we had discussed this a few years ago to um, when the new accounting standard came um, into effect and you were required to book this entire liability on the financial statements. Um, the actuary that you use calculated things slightly differently than what we'd seen from other actuaries. So this was not unexpected um, per se, but, um, but it is a big, it is a big increase. So um, now, there's no requirement to fund this liability at this point in time, unlike your net pension liability, which has an annual funding um, schedule. Um, but the town has done a really good job in terms of putting money aside into the OPEB trust fund um, every year. And at the end of fiscal year 20, there was a balance of just over $7 million in that fund, which um, is one of the highest I've seen um, in the town's audit as well. And the town, you know, really makes a concerted effort to put good good sized chunks of money into that fund every year so um that you know something that the the town should should um take pride in and it's also something that the rate setting agencies um look very favorably upon just because you're not required to fund it but everyone else is right now but your town um does fund it at a, a fairly high rate compared to some of the other towns i'm sure they're looking at so yeah, Kathy has a question now. So. Mm -hmm. um, this is a question. Um, am I unmuted, John, for when the actuary comes? Um, if they can show both the liability, but also how much we pay each year? Because um, one of the things, this is the amount in the fund balance. 
but just to, uh, to allay people's fears that we're not covering our annual retiree health costs. So just, just come in with both numbers when, when they give you that presentation. Yeah, um, when we get to that, we need to have a complete presentation because you know, that we get back to what is the plan for ultimately um, satisfying the liability and the funding of the trust was an important first step in a plan, but it's not the entire plan. Correct. Tanya, back to you. Okay, that was it. Does anyone have any questions on um, the net outlay liability? Those were really the key numbers I was going to touch on in the financial statements, um, unless anyone else had any other questions on the, that document. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, we didn't issue the town a formal management letter this year. Um, we are in the process of wrapping up the town's federal grant audit. Um, there was large delays this year from the federal government in terms of issuing the the guidance on completing that audit, uh, thanks to all the COVID and CARES money that got distributed um, kind of last minute there. So that should be done and wrapped up fairly soon. Um, we did not have any issues with that audit, so we expect to issue uh, a clean audit report. We're just, we're just working on kind of doing the final, final draft um, to get that to the town, so. So that is good as well. We did. We were not required to audit any of the CARES or COVID money or FEMA money this year. Um, there's a good chance that we will end up auditing um, the FEMA money next year as part of the fiscal year 2021 audit, just from the timing of the expenditures and when the town was um, signed a contract with FEMA. So there's certain rules on what you need to follow and when it's reported. So um, it's likely the town will be, those costs will be audited next year. And the, uh, Kathy has her hand up, and I have a yeah. question. Okay, yeah. Kathy, why don't you go first? <laughs> I have a very minor comment. It's got nothing to do with numbers, but I just noticed on you've been doing it's on page twenty-seven of typed at the bottom or page thirty when it's describing the town. You say that we have an elected town manager, and we don't. We have an appointed town manager. So it's just, I'm sure oh, okay. someone will catch that at some point, but it's. Purely uh, just a terminology change. Okay. Uh, I want to make sure I heard you correctly. Mm -hmm. While you're just wrapping up the audit of federal grants, mm -hmm. uh, there does not seem to be a problem. Right. So we've completed all the audit field work as of this point in time. I've reviewed everything. Um, we audited the town CDBG grants. Um, this fiscal year. And I'm, I'm just working on drafting the reports um, and getting a few more pieces of information from the town before I issue the, the draft of those reports, but there will be no findings. So we did not know any issues in our testing. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else from the other members of the committee at this point? Okay. Um, were you going to, uh, did you have anything in the footnotes that you wanted to um, call our attention to in particular to find or just? No, I don't think so. Yeah, no, there wasn't Hegner. anything. Hegner? Yeah, I, <clears throat> hi, uh, Tanya, I had a question on page 16 of the report and you list or here the the expenses the the column to the very left left uh the expenses are total 111 million which seems <laughs> more than we spend <laughs> um what's in these numbers that i'm missing mm. so this is your government-wide statements which um you know are not reflective of really what the town spends on the annual basis. If you would look at the fund basis statements on page 19, that is more in line with the day-to-day -day operations and what you what the town spends. Mm -hmm. um, so when we convert to your government-wide statements, we are removing capital asset expenditures and, and booking those as assets. 
Um, we remove long-term debt expenditures, both those as assets, but also as part of booking your liabilities, so your pension and your OPEB liabilities, changes in those um, flow through to your expenses. So there's a, a, a portion of that change that um, flows through there. So because there was such a big increase in your OPEB liability this year, some of those changes, they get deferred, so they get smoothed out over the year. So it doesn't all hit, um, those big changes don't hit all at once. Um, they get amortized and, and booked over like about a five year period. So uh, there's a big chunk um, of that change, your increase in your liability that got booked to expenses this year. So that's probably what's driving most of that, um, which gets allocated to your different, um, your different functions you have listed there. So you won't see that in one line itself. It's kind of spread out over your general government public safety, depending on um, with allocated based on salary. So that's um, that's the majority of that. And yeah, is depreciation expense in there as well? Yeah. yeah. Another big one, Bob, would be like depreciation, yeah. sort of a, a balance sheet expense. It's not something we actually pay. Um, right. Right. That's not cash. This is not cash basis. We're converting to full accrual basis. So if you look at there's another page too that shows the reconciliation between the two of them. Page 20 um, takes the change in your governmental funds, so your net revenues and expenses, and then shows what other um, adjustments we're making to revenues and expenses that would flow through. And, and in this case, it you know increased your expenses by a lot. And most of that is your OPEB expense mm -hmm. there. So, so that's a uh, Okay, I had one other question, and this is on page 19. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm fine. Um, so, so we get um, to uh, the total of um, the excess of revenues over expenditures is 3.042 million. Mm -hmm. And then if I add the next two columns in, I you know I add one and then subtract the other. Obviously, I wind up with the one point four eight five, and that one point five five seven is doesn't seem to be in there. And I'm curious as to is that something that's part of something else or? I or am guess. I doing the math wrong? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. So we have the the excess deficiency rev, uh, revenues over expenses of three million, three oh four two, three eight right. nine. Yep. And then you would add the add the transfers in and subtract the transfers out. Right. Which gives you a, a negative number. So three million minus the one point five million gives you one four eight five four four. Correct. Right. But then there's that line above it. And it doesn't appear to be in that equation. So negative one five five six. Right. That's the if you um, that's the total of the two lines above. So like we subtotal. Oh, okay. The okay. two million. Okay. All right. Like, oh. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, that explains it. Okay. Thank you. Sorry You're about welcome. that. No problem. No problem. There's a lot of numbers on there, so yeah. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Let's see if there are other questions from the committee. I think that uh, just as a general observation, this is not related to the presentation. Is it's difficult, uh, I think, for the finance committee or any members of the council to deal with this, and that we're so used to looking at the budget in one format, where we're looking at the amount of money that is available to us from various sources and the amount that we're proposing to spend. And that's really a very different set of numbers from what we're looking at here. And, uh, you know, the audit is done for a different purpose. And um, I don't know how we, we ever can adequately explain what that difference is. So. Anything else in the way of questions or comments? Sort of um, 
proposing that we do is um, ask that the audit be included in the packet for an upcoming council meeting as the uh, Lynn as president determines is the appropriate date and that the finance committee just present a brief report about the, uh, the that we met with Tanya and uh, what and she explained the numbers and give a very brief summary um, of what uh, the discussion was about. I think that there really will not be a lot of questions because it gets into the same problem that all of us had, but I think that it, our responsibility to explain the audit to the council, we have to do it in an understandable fashion. Dorothy, your hand is up. But you have to unmute. A small question that I think Sonia's answered before, but I'm on page nine. And on sewer operations, it has a big loss, but it does not have it underwater. I, I know that we lost money because UMass wasn't in session, but I wondered why it was so much under sewer and nothing underwater. So uh, that's page nine under governmental activities. Did you want me to answer that or, um, or Sonia? Okay. Well, no, that's fine. I, I try to find my. So, um, part of the, the difficult hmm, difficulty in looking at your enterprise funds is um, your enterprise funds and the financial statements are presented on the full accrual basis of accounting. So, like we were talking about before, they're very similar to um, your government wide state statements. Um, in terms of we capitalize your assets and book depreciation and, you know, factor in long-term debt payments and stuff like that. So the sewer fund actually wasn't in deficit um, in your town records. Um, but when we make all those adjustments, it does end up um, in a deficit in the financial statements themselves because we're converting everything to accrual basis. So speak to that. Sonia might be able to speak more to um, the actual results of operations for fiscal year 20. Um, yeah, and our budget and versus actual statements for the um, fiscal year 20 year end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we did have a deficit in water and sewer. So it was 698 in sewer, but this is different reporting than what the, what the um, audit reports are doing. This is straight general purpose um, financial statements, which are much clearer in my mind. <laughs> but yes. so we did have a, we did have a, um, we had a revenue, a pretty big revenue deficit in sewer of 753,000, but we returned some um, expenditures. Uh, we didn't spend all of our money. So we ended up with like a $648,000 deficit. That was all part of the year-end reporting. Loss, not like deficit in the fund at the end of the year. Right. Yeah, okay, yep. Loss. Yeah, okay. And Sonia, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the reason water did a little better than sewer was, didn't we have some unspent articles in water? Yeah. We were able to save this on the expenditure side. It was capital that we didn't use in the year it was voted. Yeah, so, so that- clarify that for the auditor. Yeah. <laughs> So that helped the water fund do a little better than sewer, but they both struggled um, last year. Yep. I should say good morning. Paul, I don't know if Paul has any comments or questions, so I'll leave it to him. Bernie, I see your hand is up. Bernie? Um, I just want to, uh, it, having lived through this process in other towns, uh, I, I think we really need to acknowledge uh, the, the good work that's done by by, by Sonia and Sean and, and, the, and the staff in general for this because um, it's a trial and it speaks well to integrity and honesty and accuracy of the work that uh, you know Melanson he Melanson is very confident in this uh, so uh, uh, we need to uh, we need to say thank you for a lot of good work. Thank you. And 
I appreciate you bringing that up and uh, we will include that when we report to the council because the council as a whole needs to hear about it. Uh, and uh, Tanya, is it possible that, uh, are you willing to share the PowerPoint slide with us for inclusion in the meeting packet for the meeting today? Absolutely. Would you like me to just send a PDF version of that? I can email it to. You can email it to Sean. Okay. He, he I will can do, that. Uh, do whatever's necessary to get it put into the packet. Uh, sure. Andy, I think that. unless you feel there's an urgency, uh, we'll wait to bring this to the council on the 22nd, uh, just because to turn around from. Uh, this Friday until Monday to do a report is really kind of unreasonable. Yeah, and, um, I don't think that we've sent the audit itself to the council yet. It's such a big daunting document, uh, no offense, Tanya, uh, that um, we, I don't think we want to just give it to the council the day before we discuss it. Right. Even though Let's plan that it will come to the council on the 22nd of February. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Comments, questions? Because uh, we have one other thing that it's some, um, as you know, um, and I, don't, I, I assume that uh, I'm not surprising Tanya by this, that there's been discussion that the charter requires that there be a process for uh, periodic auditor selection. And uh, we had talked about it last year and had voted, uh, had, had proposed to the council and the council agreed that we would wait to do any kind of um, solicitation of bids for audit until the FY22 audit, which would require that that process take place during FY21. And uh, so uh, we'll be looking to Sonia and Sean to propose to us um, a process and then we'll discuss it within this committee at that time, but uh, it does need to move forward. And I don't know if anybody has any comments or questions that they wanted to raise about that. We've discussed it previously, but I just wanted to remind you that we're at that point. I, I want to just make sure that Tanya, yeah. this is not a reflection on her, but a standard practice. Yes, no, I understand that. Thank you. And I'm actually going to head out. I just didn't want to interrupt and, and say goodbye. Um, okay. I, yeah, so um, it was nice to see you all again. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to work for the town. It, it, you know, the town is fantastic in terms of, you know, what Bernie was saying in terms of the financial reporting team. Um, they've always put uh, forth a effort to, you know, retain the highest quality staff, and it, it's really important. And it really shows in terms of how well the town um, town's finances are doing. So, I did want to echo that because I wholeheartedly agree. Yes, um, thank you for saying that. And that I think what we'll do is make a recommendation to the town manager that um, he revoke from Sonia any privilege to retire. <laughs> Seriously, right. She's not allowed. I'm full on board with that. Seriously. Um, yes. Um, you know, one thing to consider, I don't know when Sonia is planning on retiring, though. Um, one kind of, you know, push to retain us for another year or so is, you know, changing auditors and changing um, accounting staff in the same year might kind of be a disaster. But, um, <laughs> you know, we are there. We do know the, you know, how the town operates and how things work. So it is, you know, can be beneficial to retain the consistent auditors over that time. But I'm just, I understand, you know, the process needs to happen and I, and I can appreciate that. I just wanted to throw that out there um, as something that might be, might assist the town during that transition, so. Thank you. That's my... yeah. So thank you, Tanya, <laughs> we appreciate right. you being with us today and uh, thank you for the report.
You're welcome. Take care, everyone. Stay safe, please. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Okay. So our other major item for the day, really, uh, I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Sean because um, what we were going to talk about is the financial projection changes that um, uh, for FY22. And I think that in, in your packet, and I hope you had a chance to see it, I think you sent it out separately, there was a uh, FY22 um, amended projection report. And uh, I, I made a couple suggestions on things that might want to be included by Sean, but I'll turn it over to you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, before I do so, um, the, there is a FY22 projection in the packet. Andy had asked about putting a side by side with the, um, the original projection in November for the, that was used for the budget guidelines. So the version I'm going to show, which I'll add to the packet after, has that comparison. So you can see how we're, you know, you can see more clearly where things changed. All right. Can everybody see that on their screen? Hearing no objections, I will assume that you can. So uh, what you have here is a couple of years of actual, the FY21 recap, which wasn't done at the time of um, the November projection. And then we have our current projections right here in the blue. And then the column I added is this uh, peachy color here on the right that shows what was projected back for the indicators report. Um, so the first big update is here on the revenue side and the property taxes. Um, you'll see back in FY20 or in the indicators report, we projected 58.7 million. Um, and now we're about 59 million. And the biggest reason for that is the new growth. So at the time of the indicators report, we were still being conservative on new growth. We hadn't certified it yet. Um, about a month after or so we had certified new growth and, and it came in higher than our budget. So we came in at, at 747,000 for new growth. Um, which is a positive sign. And, and we're still working on for next year. We want to be conservative given the pandemic on new growth. And so we're working with our assessor's office um, to see if this $500,000 number is, is the right number for next year. Um, but that made a pretty big impact on our revenues. The next section, local receipts. So the biggest change here is we actually lowered it a little bit. Um, and this was really driven by the Q2 report that uh, Sonia presented last time. And then this licenses and permits, when we looked at what we brought in through the first two quarters of FY21, it looked like we were projecting a little high if, if we wanna be conservative and, and um, not over budget our revenues for next year. So we, we did drop that down to more in line with what we were seeing in the Q2 report um, presented last week. Everything else stayed pretty much the same. There was a small adjustment here in special assessments, and that's because we received our actual PBTA assessment bill. Um, and so we updated this number with actuals. And, and this side here is, this is the money we get back from um, UMass and five colleges to offset our, our PBTA assessment. The biggest development was state aid. So we were level funding back during the indicators report. Um, since then we have received the governor's budget, which called for a three and a half percent increase in unrestricted general government aid, which is this uh, number here. So you can see that's about a $300,000 increase from the prior year, um, a small increase in chapter 70. There was a big increase as well in charter uh, assessment, charter tuition assessment reimbursement, but that usually, and you'll see in a second, that usually goes hand in hand with um, charter tuition going up because it's a, a sort of a one for one reimbursement for new costs. So it's not necessarily a good thing. And so that went up, you know, about two and a half, 200,000, 250,000 um, from where we were for the indicators report. And then the last thing on the revenue side that we adjusted, and this was more of a negative, um, but we feel it puts us in a, a safer position for next year's budget, is this enterprise fund reimbursement section. 
So we originally had budgeted 920,000, which assumed a, um, a full indirect cost payment from the transportation fund. And after we saw the second quarter report and how poorly sort of transportation revenues have been, been doing this year because of the pandemic, um, even if transportation bounces back fully next year, we may want a year where we don't get that indirect cost so the transportation fund can rebuild its fund balance because its fund balance might get depleted this year um, because of the pandemic. So we actually pulled out, we lowered this revenue assumption to assume that we're not gonna get the, the indirect from transportation next year. Um, just again, to be safe, given everything going on with transportation, that's really our biggest struggle right now. So before I go on to- pause for, I'm gonna yeah. pause for a second just to ask one question of my fellow council members. Do, does everybody feel comfortable that they understand the enterprise fund reimbursements, how that's, what that's about, how it's calculated? If I don't see any hands raised, I'm going to assume we can just go on. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Andy, I also didn't know, did you want to stop oh, now? Dorothy, did you, did you yeah. raise hand? I want to explain it more, I'd appreciate it. Okay. So we, um, we calculate indirect costs for all the enterprise funds. We basically how much um, the services that we don't charge directly to the enterprise fund, like accounting's time and human resources time and town manager's time and, and a variety of other things. And we budget that in the enterprise fund and the enterprise fund then pays it to the general fund based as sort of compensation for that indirect cost. Um, and in most years, that's not a problem. If, but if the enterprise fund is struggling and, and struggling with its revenues and expenses, that's one area where we look to adjust um, if, if we need to reduce the expenses in the enterprise fund. So for a number of years, the solid waste fund had not been paying any overhead costs because that was uh, a problematic enterprise fund as far as uh, whether it was uh, struggling to break even um, so that essentially the, the town was picking up those administrative expenses and uh, I assume that that's still true for the uh, next year for or for but the we're at or for the current year that we're adding in just one additional enterprise fund into that category. Yeah, and um, and one thing Sony and I have talked about, and we haven't sort of settled on whether we want to go forward with it, is um, you know we're going to keep track of these years where the enterprise funds weren't able to maybe make the full indirect cost payment, and if things rebound in a very positive fashion, then we may try to recoup that in future years um, because the you know the enterprise funds should be paying all of their costs um, when they can. So we're going to keep track of these years where we have lowered it. Um, and then if things turn around, we can try to recoup it. Hey, Sean, this is Bob. We're still tracking those costs, aren't we? Those indirect costs? Yeah, we're still tracking those costs. And you know, actually for, for budgeting in the enterprise fund, we're still gonna try to budget that the enterprise fund aims to make the payment. We just don't wanna assume it on the general fund side, but we're still gonna try to make that payment next year in the enterprise funds, assuming revenues turn around and are, are doing better. Um, you know, we'll see what we can do, but we just didn't want to assume it here, not knowing what, what that transportation fund's going to look like. Sure. Un understood. But yeah, we are tracking it still. Yeah. Okay. Great. Any other revenue questions before I move on to expenses? Again, state aid was a, was a, a nice development, um, sort of surprising to some extent, um, that state aid came in where it did, but we're happy to have it. All right, I will keep going. So on the expense side, um, one thing that will help next year is, is being able to increase operating budgets a little bit. So the indicators report, we had level funded the operating budget and now we feel comfortable, or at least at this time, uh, we're projecting a one and a half percent increased operating budgets. It's still sort of lower than the traditional where we try to get to, which is two and a half percent, but it, it'll be better than flat, um, especially for some departments that are struggling a little more with costs going up. Then the next section is capital. 
So capital, um, we've gotten to eight and a half percent of the levy. It's actually a little higher than we had projected for during the indicators report. It doesn't look that way. You know, if you look at what was in the indicators report, it was 4.8, but we were only actually assuming 8% of the levy back then. We had a, a placeholder in there for some of the costs that were um, rolling over from FY21. When I pulled that out, we and with these other good positive developments, we were able to get the, it up to eight and a half percent of the levy. Um, so we're, you know, our ultimate goal is to get to ten percent or higher. Um, and so th this is good to try to get this back up to where it was. Um, a couple things. This is a sort of a moving target area because there's still a couple pieces that we're working on. Um, one thing we're waiting for is the region debt assessment that changes year to year. And so tomorrow at the four town meeting. We, we had an initial presentation on what they thought the debt assessment would look like next year. Um, and then tomorrow we'll probably get a more specific um, projection of what they think the debt assessment will be. And we'll, we'll update this number. So this could, I don't think it'll go any higher than this. I think it'll come down a little bit and that'll help out um, other capital needs. And then also um, projecting out our temporary borrowings is something that changes a little bit throughout the process. In miscellaneous, so we were able to update the expenses with the actual retirement assessment, um, which came came in really close to what we were projecting. You can see it was you know almost right on for a six point six million dollar number. So that was that was nice. Um, we did increase OPEB a little bit from the two fifty. We we were at five hundred and we cut that down to two point two hundred fifty thousand for FY twenty one. Um, with the increases in revenues, we thought it would be a good idea not to lose sight of trying to return to where we were, um, especially as you heard from our auditor, you know, the, the importance of funding OPEB and, and our percentage that we've done a good job on. So we did bring that back up to 300,000 with still more room to go to get back to where we were. And then the um, last piece is this unappropriated uses. So we have in or the big change here was the state assessments. Um, so that came down a little bit too. And actually it was the charter tuition, um, the original. It, so what we budgeted for FY21 dropped a lot to what we actually received um, for FY21. And then it did come up a little bit for, we are projecting a little bit of an increase for FY22, but it's still well below what we had budgeted. For FY21 and charters again, not one of those numbers that's a moving target. You know, we, we won't know exactly what next year's tuition costs are until next December. Um, but the revenues and the expenses track in parallel, so um, they, they usually can cover each other. And so we had back when we did the indicator report, we had about a two hundred thousand uh, dollar positive uh, variable at that point, and right now we're about even. And we'll keep updating this. This is, you know, we're still relatively early in the budget process. So we keep updating these with our, you know, what we're seeing for actuals. And if we hear things, anything that might affect one of our state revenue numbers or anything like that. So this, this will keep being updated throughout the process. Any questions on the expense side? Um, yeah, I have a question. Can you go to the last line of revenues compared to a piece. And so when I wrote down, compared to what we had before, we're now saying we have um, roughly, I'm just really rounding, not quite right, $300,000 more than we thought we had. So mm -hmm. I'm just doing 83,953 compared to 84,299. Mm -hmm. um, and then in expenses, um, we've got, 760,000 more in expenses than we, we had before. Again, I'm, do, I'm comparing when I get down to expenses. So I'm just, and part of that I think is you had budgeted 200,000 surplus. So if you put that back in, we're not that much higher. So right. if I put that 200 back in, I get to 500,000. So it's just, you know, cause it's, we don't have that much more revenue, but we're now saying we can do one and a half percent increases. So I'm just trying to reconcile those two numbers. And it's, I think the explanation is some of the other expenses went down just enough yep. that 
allow us to shift things into operating budgets if, if I didn't go through compared to again compared to that extra column Andy had you add in because I couldn't do it from what you'd sent it is, is am I right that if enough things went down in expenses from what we were projecting that we got more money even though we only got you're only projecting about a net of three hundred thousand dollars more in revenue so it's not a lot more money it's just a little bit more money yeah, I mean, the number that the big one that I'm looking at right now is the state assessment number came down. Right. Um, okay. But you are, you are um, calculating in a uh, shortfall of 200,466 or 465 and you had zero. It was balanced last time. No, she, they had a surplus. They had a surplus, Andy, of 200. Is the right. way I. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. Yeah, so that's what I'm doing. Is I said if there were no surplus, our expenses would have been 83. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, so the last day, it wasn't enough. The 200,000 wasn't, you know, we were, it was still early on. So we didn't want to go, we were trying to be conservative and we didn't want to um, sort of tell departments they had an increase before we saw what the state was doing. And, and we, at the time, we still thought we might have to use reserves for state aid. So, but now that we've heard more about that. That's why we feel comfortable going this direction. Okay, so then that was question number one, just to make sure I'm reading it right. And then when I go back up to where you're suggesting the newfound money <coughs> can go, you have everyone getting one and a half percent except for elementary schools, why? You know, we just don't like the elementary schools as much. <laughs> um, no. uh, so, so. Yeah, if you, if you remember the um, a long time ago when I first started um, at the schools, charter and choice tuition used to be in the school's budget. And the decision was made after, I think it was actually after an audit um, opinion was that the, sc the school shouldn't have the charter and choice tuition in their school's budget because the town actually is the one that has to pay that directly. And so we ended up pulling the choice and charter tuition out of the school budget but the agreement at the time was that we would still adjust the allocation to the schools on a year to year basis for the net change in charter and choice tuition. So if the net cost of charter and choice tuition went up, then the allocation that was given to the schools that year would be adjusted by however much it went up. So if you, there's a little note here that you might not be able to see, um, but the net charter tuition had gone up um, by about $80,000. And that's again, when we look at charter and choice tuition, it had gone up. So we, that gets adjusted out of the increase to the schools. Um, and, it, and we do it looking back at actual. So it's not like the year, like the exact, it's not this current year because we don't have the actuals for this year. So we do a look back at actuals to make that adjustment. Yep. And can I add to that? That was an attempt a long time ago to um, show true education costs. So um, one of the finance directors a very long time ago decided to put those costs into the school operating budget. It was the DOR that finally put their foot down and said, we can't adjust it like we've been doing it. So we had to go back and book the full cherry sheet the way it comes in on the recap instead of adjusting it like we were doing it. So then we had to figure out another way to show the true um, education costs. So we did a, we did a net of what gets budgeted for them. And it so always causes it a question and a complicated huh? explanation. So it, it always, this, this adjustment always causes a, um, yeah, I know. question and a complicated explanation. So, you know, it's something we can talk about if there's a, a, a more clear way to do it in the future. Yeah. But it came down from the DOR just so everyone knows. Yeah, it just, it, you know, it visually you see it right away and you're, you're cute. It, you know, we certainly don't want to um, say we're, we're hurrying them. And yeah. I think the other confusing thing is why I've focused on the, I only see 300,000 more in revenues, but suddenly for operating budgets, we've got 900,000 more to spend, you know, just trying to, when we explain this, explain it in ways that people can understand without going through all these lines. Um, mm -hmm. And then, and then one thing I'll point out on the elementary schools is I believe last year they were on the, the positive side of this where their increase actually came in higher. And there were questions about why their increase was coming in higher than everybody else's. And it was for the same reason that their net 
charter and choice tuition costs actually went down. So they got a, a bigger increase than others. So it, it has worked both ways um, over the years. Yep. Thank you. No questions? So seeing none, I would suggest though this is obviously um, open for discussion that we just uh, forward this under the council with an explanation as um, Kathy's actually suggested the key points to include in an explanation and uh, leave it at that. I don't think that um, other action is required. Um, it's not a large enough change uh, to really affect most of what prior work has been done. And I don't think it's worth revisiting uh, the guidelines either in the committee level or the council level. I think we just reported along and, uh, you know, the guidelines are sort of with, this is a conservative approach, but uh, uh, we're still at a conservative approach just with better numbers. Kathy has her hand up. Kathy. Yeah, but it, so, um, to, am I unmuted? Yeah. So tomorrow, at the regional school meeting, are we going to be saying that Amherst now has this one and a half percent as opposed to a complete flat? Is that going to be fed into that discussion, or are we going to hold that news? So we've already communicated to um, the library and to the regional schools the one and a half percent. Um, mainly because we wanted them to have it before their, uh, the region actually presented their budget on Tuesday. And so we wanted them to have that information before they presented the budget. Um, so they didn't present the budget and then change it two days later. Um, so the, re the region Jones Library are aware. And they didn't have it when um, Mike was talking about uh, cutting 14 positions. So that they didn't have this information then. I think they they had it for the, the presentation Tuesday night. So I think, I'm not sure the exact number of position reductions, but. Okay, so that was already, he already had that information from this past Tuesday night then you're saying. Yeah, we, again, we wanted to give, we, we wanted to get this information to them as soon as possible. So they developed their initial budget with it as opposed that, to. That was just. One and then changing it, yeah. Okay, thank you. So I wanna just make sure that uh, we've communicated this spreadsheet to the full council so that they understand that tomorrow at the four towns meeting that this is common knowledge. Mm -hmm. I, I believe, Paul, you've already sent an email like that. Yes, yeah, so that's what I think last earlier this week we sent out a, yeah. or I sent out an email to alert the council. Um, in a, prior to the school committee's budget being presented. And I just want to point out that this is a working document. You know, Sonia Chan changed this mm -hmm. daily, weekly. I mean, it's always being adjusted based on new information. And, and if they're and we bring it to you when there's a significant enough development of it that it makes sense to keep sharing it with you. Yeah. So, but it's something that we will continue to refine over the next two months as we, as we build our budget. Kathy, you still have your hand up? Oh, no, I meant to take it down, sorry. So, uh, okay, anyone else? I don't see anything else. Um, so I think that we know where we're at. I just want to remind everybody, since it's already come up as a topic, that um, tomorrow is a Four Towns meeting, uh, resident, uh, members of this committee are, of course, welcome to participate in the Four Towns meeting. Um, it really is uh, two separate meetings as it, uh, on, on a technological basis because the schools have arranged a Four Town meeting. And uh, if you, I, I had uh, sent out a notice that if you wanted a link to it so that you could actually uh, have, the, have a direct link to uh, let staff know so that they could make that arrangement. Um, the other meeting is that um, traditionally what had happened when we met physically at the uh, middle school or high school is that there was a, 
presentation and there's a time for each town to have a breakout session and then we get back together. Now you have to do that technologically. So there's a separate meeting uh, that has to be arranged to with uh, so that uh, each town can uh, recess their participation as appropriate in the four all four towns being together to if there's a desire to have a breakout session for each town specifically and uh, so that's why there's two meetings posted and uh, we will uh, carry on tomorrow um, and uh, I think Kathy's asked and already alerted us to the question that we're all aware of which is that uh, this has already been factored in and the tensions will continue to be there as they always are of uh, the budget and the assessment method being two issues that are out there for consideration. Anything else that anyone wants to add? You do have one audience member that might want yeah. to speak. Yeah, so I was going to do that next. Um, we always, at some point during the meeting, um, want to per allow for uh, public comment. Public comment is posted as a item on the agenda. So I will be looking for raised hands from the uh, on the attendees side to see if there's any request for um, opportunity to make public comment and. Uh, pause to give you a chance to do that. Seeing none, it does not appear that there's a request for public comment um, at today's meeting and we'll let the uh, uh, minutes reflect that uh, there was no request for public comment. As far as the uh, uh, issues that were not anticipated or um, other items. I mean, I think that the major thing that we are at now is that um, I don't have a specific schedule of meetings. I've had some discussions with Sean about uh, what's anticipated for coming meetings uh, at our uh, next meeting and we're now I think by uh, the plan is to go into the first and third Tuesdays and uh, this anomaly of having this one meeting late in the week is really um, done and we're getting we're getting back to Tuesdays after um, after this meeting and um, the next meeting then is on February 16, and uh, I think that we have an agenda that uh, is filling up pretty well for that particular meeting. Um, and Sean can help me uh, with it. Um, Dorothy, I saw your hand briefly there and disappeared. A little confused. Um, on February the 16th, I. Okay, so we're okay. We have all we've got that set. So it's not going to conflict with CRC. CRC is going to be the next week, right? Okay, that's great. I just had to. I'm so so used to getting confused on the two meetings. So yeah, no, this was uh, um, all in an effort to try and make sure that we were uh, um, not conflicting with CRC any further. Okay, thank you so much. So, so the Andy, the thing, the big thing we talked about presenting on the 16th was um, sort of the initial presentation of the four building projects plan. And then not, I don't know if we had anything else scheduled after that. Yes, at the council meeting on Monday, CPA will be making a presentation uh, of their recommendations and that's an automatic referral to the finance committee. And so the other agenda item on the 16th will be surfacing our questions about those recommendations. And for those of you that are on the finance committee as but not on the council, 
uh, some non-voting members, you can either attend the council meeting on Monday night. My guess is this will be sometime around seven on the agenda. That's praying a lot. Um, and then, um, but we will also make sure you have uh, the videotape of the presentations. So we're not gonna ask for another round of presentations at the finance committee meeting, but there will be uh, staff and possibly um, the chair of the um, CPA who is in the audience right now. Um, so um, she may be there as well as staff to answer questions on the 16th. So I think those are the two major items that will be on that next agenda and uh, <clears throat> Sean is uh, preparing with Paul a presentation that um, of his latest analysis on the four building projects and uh, how they, you know, the, the financing option that um, are being, that staff is going to um, suggest. So, if there's nothing else, um, to look to the committee to see if you have anything else, please. I look forward to seeing anybody who's able to attend tomorrow for the Four Towns meeting. And uh, that's our next step in the budget process. And it is going to be an important one because how that comes out is going to affect our budget down the line. So if there's nothing else, then I think that uh, we can treat ourselves as adjourned. So I will note that, the, that we did well today and adjourned at 3.30. Mm -hmm.